Good afternoon and welcome to uh, this webinar on storage, uh, deployment of storage solutions for a decarbonized energy system. My name is Christian Ruby. I'm the Secretary General of Your Electric and I'm going to guide you through this uh, discussion this afternoon. We have a new report to present today and we have a very uh, uh, prominent uh, lineup of, uh, of, of experts and decision makers in this space. So I really look forward to this uh, discussion. We want to involve you in the discussion, but we have a lot of people coming online. We have uh, more than 600 registered participants and uh, they're just ticking in as we're discussing. Um, so we are gonna have a couple of polls uh, to, to have the discussion uh, going and hear your views. We also encourage you to, to basically post uh, your questions uh, via the interface. If you look at uh, the screen just below you, uh, we should have a, um, a little uh, slide showing how you do this. You basically use the question tab uh, that's, that's shown just on the uh, slide here. Uh, then you put your question in there. If you wanna address it to someone special uh, in the panel, please do so. Please write clearly who it is. We'll try to get to those. Um, but as you see, we have many participants uh, online today, so uh, we may not come through all the questions. So, what is this all about? As you all know, we're moving into a decarbonized future. We are uh, changing the energy system at record pace. We estimate that by 2050, uh, more than 80% of all electricity will be coming from renewables. And mind you, that is in a world where a lot of end use sectors have electrified so that uh, electricity may account for 50% or even 60% of total final energy consumption. So with that many renewables, how are we gonna make sure that there's electricity in, in your plug 24 seven and that uh, the renewables are firmly backed up uh, by uh, solutions that allow us to run the system in a, in a reliable manner? So that's what we're trying to assess here today. And, um, and that's where the, the issue of storage comes in. How much storage is needed? Um, what are the other flexibility options? How are they gonna play together? And what policy uh, instruments can help us get the deployment going. That's uh, what we've investigated with our experts uh, and, um, and that's what we're presenting in the report that uh, we're showing you uh, here today for the first time. With us, as I said, we have a very uh, prominent set of experts and policymakers. We're very happy to have a member of the European Parliament, Claudia Gamon, with us. She is the rapporteur of um, the uh, own initiative report on energy storage in the European Parliament. We also have with us Maximilian Urban. He is the chair of our uh, working group on technology in the grid space. He's also uh, um, with uh, Netz Niederösterreich GmbH, a DSO working out of Austria. Then we have Erki Maillard, who's the senior vice president of EU affairs and also the diplomatic advisor to the CEO of EDF. And I want to thank EDF uh, also at this occasion for being our event partner today. And uh, last but not least, we have Beatriz um, Sinobas, uh, who is the team leader of energy security and uh, electricity at the European Commission. Um, from our side, we have also uh, Viola Rocher, who's going to present the report uh, for us today. She is the head of the ENBW office in, in Brussels, and she's also the chair of the renewables and storage working group in, in Euroelectric. Before we uh, get going with the report, however, uh, we would like to hear your views. Uh, so we prepared uh, two questions, two poll questions, and we're gonna have the first one uh, displayed on the screen uh, today, uh, right now. So essentially by 2050, uh, more than 80% of electricity generation will come from variable renewables. Um, what do you think would be the most important flexibility option? And you basically vote by clicking the small white icon next to the options. And I should tell the, um, the panelists, they are unfortunately not able to vote. So um, give us your vote and let's, let's see what uh, people believe is the most important flexibility option going forward. I think um, we should be able to close the vote in a few seconds time. People are still voting. And as we wait for the vote, I can, um, I can reveal to you that uh, whereas we go from 
2050 uh, with 80 percent renewables already by 2030 we expect to have some 60 percent of renewables on the grid so here are the results uh, storage is expected to be uh, the number one solution uh, with 60 percent uh, of you voting for that generation uh, coming in at 23 uh, demand side management at 35 and networks as 19 What's interesting here, in my view, is that first of all, we're seeing that all the flexibility options are valued by the participants uh, out there. And what's also interesting to see is that uh, the solutions that perhaps are the most important, most deployed today, backup generation and, and uh, flexibility through grids are the ones that are, let's say, um, expected to have the lower participation in the future energy system lots of expectations for storage, lots of expectations for demand side management um, as we move towards a, a decarbonized energy system. I think that's a very interesting, um, uh, let's say, preliminary uh, insight from, from the audiences uh, for, for you to begin your presentation, Viola, because essentially it puts a lot of expectations to storage. Um, let's see if we have Viola with us here right there she is um a warm welcome to you and a, and a big thank you for for all the work that you have put in into this important report i know this has uh, gone through a lot of iterations we've had a lot of expert views also a big thank you to Hélène Labré, uh, our senior specialist from the secretariat who's uh, also been putting in a lot of hours to make this happen but uh, viola without further ado let me give the floor to you Yes, hello and uh, good afternoon to everybody also from my side. Uh, definitely this poll result is a very encouraging one. <laughs> Shows uh, definitely also that uh, this report comes really uh, at the right time. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to present the report and maybe also to be challenged on it. Um, it is the first comprehensive Euroelectric report and positioning on storage related issues. Um, there are definitely very well-placed associations to deal with the subject, just to name the most prominent one, ease. But um, uh, as storage is taking an ever more important part in the business of our members, it was definitely time to clarify and spell out our positioning on it. Uh, thereby, uh, we are concentrating on the specific added value uh, a year electric position could contribute to, uh, which is to evaluate the place and contribution storage can bring from a comprehensive system perspective and uh, the related challenges and barriers for further deployment, as well as the recommendation for an enabling and regulatory framework. Uh, the report discusses storage options for the benefit of the whole energy sector. However, with the main focus um, for, uh, on electricity storage, which means storage from the perspective of the electricity system with subsequent feedback into the original electricity system. So uh, if you could please go to the next slide. To set the framework of our approach, your electric, uh, uh, electricity, sorry, electricity is a key solution towards Europe's decarbonization, not only with its own solutions to decarbonize quicker than other sectors. Uh, the electricity sector made the pledge to become carbon neutral by 2045, but also with its contribution to decarbonize other sectors like transport buildings and industry cost effectively. These graphs show the dynamic in the changing electricity mix in Europe. Christian mentioned already a couple of, of, of figures. Um, today, or in, in 2019, carbon neutral energy sources already represented 60% of the electricity generation mix of the EU, with 34% uh, renewables, half of it being variable. And this will steadily grow. To meet the current 2030, target and renewables target, the share of renewables alone in the electricity generation mix must increase to roughly 60%, not yet taking into account the current debate on higher targets, um, where we discuss about 38 to 40% uh, from today, 32% uh, of um, uh, uh, whole uh, energy consumption. The Electric's decarbonization pathway study shows that in a carbon neutral power sector, renewables will account for roughly 80%, also this figure Christian mentioned already, of the total installed capacity and generation by um, 
2045 and uh, mainly due to the big increase in wind and solar. Um, next slide, please. Um, already with the current targets, this would mean for wind capacity in 2030, a roughly doubling of the 2019 capacity. And for solar, next slide, please. We would expect a tripling of the current solar deployment. This means the major increase is meant to come from variable sources. The large change in generation mix with wind and solar replacing thermal generation has implications both on uh, system stability and a secure power supply at any time. The delivery of stabilizing, stabilizing services to grids from thermal generators has to be replaced as well as the lack of firmness of the generation um, from wind and solar has to be compensated. On shorter time scales, like milliseconds, hours, up to days, and up to long term, which means then seasons and years. The development of this new firm and flexible capacity at large scale is a major technical and economic challenge, but vary, which varies also largely over the different countries and regions in Europe. As you see uh, on the next slide, please. For the example of the UK, if you compare the system of today with the projected capacity requirements in 2050 in storage, from a short to longer term um, availability need as well as the different needed response time. While the faster short term needs are expected to double or triple, the need for weekly backup will already have to be fourfold, but the major bulk of capacity needed comes from interseasonal and sector coupling chain uh, challenges. This picture, however, will be different in, in Spain, France, Eastern countries, uh, or the Nordics, depending on the availability of more firm solutions, like, for instance, hydropower or also nuclear. According to Euroelectric's estima estimations, approximately 500 gigawatt of flexible power will be needed in 2030, including uh, storage solutions, but also demand side management, firm backup generation, or ever better connected transmission and distribution networks. And this um, enumeration already shows that um, Yes, storage will make a significant contribution to flexibility, but it should be considered among the other solutions. And as we see on the next slide, the different uh, storage technologies can play a different role in the system, individually or in aggregate with other flexibility resources. Here we try to give an overview of the different flexibility services according to technologies and timescales. When considering the potentials as well as challenges and ways forward, one has to keep in mind the different applications and services of storage in the energy system and the technologies suitable for them in different timeframes. It has to be reminded that electricity storage is not new, but historically its development had been mainly limited to pumped hydroelectric storage. As you can see on the next slide, please. To date, almost all uh, of the grid connected electricity storage, 97%, is still carried out by pumped storage hydro with 44 gigawatt out of uh, 53 gigawatt. And its potential is still far from being exhausted. However, the need to integrate the ever increasing share of variable rests has led to an increasing interest for different storage technologies, both at grid level and behind the meter, which means at the consumer premises. In its long term strategy, the Commission estimates that scenarios with electrification and end users uh, requires a high deployment of storage up to six times of today's level in 2050. However, 
concrete figures are difficult to estimate. We really tried hard to, to give um, the best estimates in our, our report, but it will depend largely on how the rest of the energy system evolves and therefore also the general framework, market conditions and um, technology developments. The Commission report uh, from May this year on storage is rather optimistic that up to 2030 a large share of required flexibility will still come from conventional plants and networks. However, on the basis of your electric 2090 power barometer, we have our doubts as um, at least we are less optimistic as uh, we also see quite a huge amount of uh, firm capacity, around 40 gigawatt of coal and 20 gigawatt of nuclear is set to be closed already by 25. Also, the Commission storage report estimates 550 gigawatts of electrolyzers by 2050 and uh, pumped storage and batteries even lower in 2050 than in 2030. The electric decarbonization pathways shows more of our estimates would be more around um, having more or less parity between power to X uh, hydrogen with up to 206 gigawatts and uh, batteries alone, for instance, with, 900, uh, uh, with 196 gigawatt. Everything will also depends on how technology costs will evolve and um, how the policy flame framework uh, will be set. For short term and daily flexibility, either solutions are already available or promising emerging technologies with hydropower and batteries providing fast flexibility. By 2030, pumped hydro and lithium ion batteries are expected to provide bulk of storage capacities. Where we see the most challenging issues is definitely on the long term flexibility. Next slide, please. So uh, what will what do we see as the main challenges? Well, we could um, arrange it in well technical ones. There are definitely main challenges um, in finding the best technologies able to satisfy the future electricity system needs through a safe, reliable, sustainable and efficient technology portfolio for short and long durations. Um, we have mature or rather mature technologies like pumped hydro lithium ion batteries. Um, but they still have optimization potential, batteries when it comes to lifetime consumption and uh, degradation, which depends on the number of cycles, so the different usages. Hydropower also have uh, uh, options still to, to, to be optimized. And on others, there's still need to considerable, for considerable technical developments uh, to reach scale potential, uh, like flow batteries, compressed or liquid air flywheels or also power to X. Um, but then um, there are definitely a couple of challenges also when it comes to business cases. Um, the need in different member states might rise in different time scales. However, in, in general, it might not be sufficient for long-term price signals allowing for cost-effective transition in, as in whole. Um, when it comes to wholesale markets, um, successfully uh, they successfully coordinate short-term operations and offer mid-term hedge, financial hedging possibilities. However, there again, long-term signals are still questionable. The clean energy package is definitely an important step forward uh, to a better wholesale market framework. Um, it recognizes storage with its own definition, although focused on electricity and, uh, and also um, in, uh, flexible uh, demand options. Um, there are a couple of uh, barriers are uh, potentially removed um, and thus stimulating uh, also the retail markets. Uh, there are clearer roles for ownership and operation between market and regulated business um, and also clearer options for DSOs to exploit flexible options um, by active customers. However, here it's definitely the effective implementation um, and still uh, in some cases clarification which is needed 
and also uh, which comes with the whole clean energy package uh, the very welcomed uh, national energy and climate plans should uh, member states should be hold more um, responsible to reflect also the storage op options and, and plans more clearly um, in it um, so um, the problems there are still uh, not everywhere the appropriate framework in every member state is set in, in place or implemented implemented well uh, there are still barriers to revenue stacking for instance um, etc uh, but also then costs and uh, revenues vary very strongly between technologies uh, and project locations there are definitely challenges uh, like by the way, in the whole energy system, whatever uh, investment project you take, it's the permitting issue. Um, here also uh, uh, clear rules um, and, and uh, wherever possible speeding up of permitting procedures uh, should be uh, pursued. We have a challenge um, also when it comes to uh, the fair level playing field and, and the right business case when it comes to taxes and levies. Uh, and also on tariffs, uh, the right balance has to be struck that everybody can recover its costs, but everybody is also fairly fairly charged for uh, also in view to their contribution to the whole system. Um, there are also issues in, um, still on connecting rules and grid codes where uh, um, storage is still purely foreseen and then has to be uh, their clarification would be needed. And then we have obviously, as said, uh, for the less mature technologies, but even for the mature ones, the R&D issue, where uh, um, also the funds should have a close view also on, on the options and potentials to foster the storage uh, technology developments. Um, next slide, please. So what are the recommendations then we have? Um, so first and foremost, um, don't forget that storage isn't a goal in itself. The challenge is flexibility in our view. And in view to unlock the most effective and cost efficient solutions, we have to ensure the level playing field for all the different flexibility options. Um, as well as the different storage uh, solutions as such, so different um, technologies. Um, and there again, the different electric ones, as well as the non-electric ones, where we talk about the, the, the sector coupling and sector integration. Technology neutrality is key in this issue. That said, we are convinced that storage, storage if treated fairly, is likely to play really a major role, um, which uh, is very much in line with the outcome of the poll in the beginning of this uh, session. Second, we have to secure the reliability of the whole electricity system with challenges at all voltage levels of the grid infrastructure. Therefore, we have to take a holistic approach when it comes to detect the best solutions and applications, where to tackle them and how in the best coordinated way possible. This means strict technical coordination, um, defining appropriate and consisting economic signals, standardization which involves all actors um, DS, TSOs, DSOs but also the, the market participants. Third um, as one of the key elements of the level playing field is to get the market framework right as said the clean energy package is already a major step forward but must be really effectively implemented so and therefore sometimes we need some more guidance clarification as said, we are confident uh, that it will definitely improve the functioning of the shorter markets. However, the biggest challenge is to get the long-term signals right. Uh, and therefore, um, we have to ensure and, and closely monitor that we all have already all instruments at hand. Anyways, keys is uh, strengthening the emission trading, steam, uh, trading system, um, thus further stimulating the um, incentives for decarbonization solutions um, and also foster well-functioning markets like, as we hear with the six recommendations, enabling the active engagement of presumers and uh, storage owners, um, ensuring a level playing field between flexibility enablers and removing barriers like double taxations and levies. On the grid side, we have to ensure uh, that an optimal use of storage to stabilize the grid where needed and on which level is possible. 
grid capacities that said, including interconnectors, allow for a better pooling of resources uh, and distribution over larger regions. Uh, seventh, don't forget about hydropower. Um, we have a huge flexibility source at hand, which is particularly suited not only for short, but also for long-term seasonal storage challenges. All barriers that prevent investments and reinvestments, um, upgrading or continuous operations have to be minimized as far as possible. Uh, the potential for additional flexibility via increased power capacity in existing assets, uh, but also improved interconnections for using this flexibility over wider areas, as already said, um, as well as the development of new assets uh, should be pursued. Uh, as mentioned already, uh, establishing clear rules and permitting procedures for the deployment of storage assets and tenth to, for, to address the technical, technical barriers uh, while um, we, we have to direct uh, research and development funds for close to market implementation programs and energy efficiency improvements. I will stop here. So far, the short presentation of the key elements of the report and I'm very curious to hear uh, what the other panelists have to say, your reactions and questions and happy to exchange on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Viola, for this very uh, succinct and um, and uh, uh, good overview of um, of the report and and its key findings. Uh, let me uh, turn the word immediately uh, over to Claudia Gamon from the European Parliament. We're very happy to have you with us uh, here today, Claudia. Um, you've done your own uh, report uh, on on storage. Um, what what do you make of of uh, the your electric uh, recommendations? Well, um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this panel. Um, it's been very interesting um, to hear about your report. Um, my name is Claudia Gamon. I'm an MEP uh, from Austria in the Liberal Group in the Parliament Renew Europe. And I was the rapporteur for an, an initiative report on energy storage. And I can say that I, I heard many, many similarities to what we had, had researched and discussed for our report um, uh, just as as was presented now, I mean, I want to I want to congratulate you on on the report itself and the outstanding work. It's important to highlight the the importance of energy storage in general. I believe uh, we don't talk about it enough, even though um, there has been some movement, also thanks to the initiative report from the Parliament, but. I think especially the numbers that were presented really highlight the importance that storage as a general topic will have for the energy transition um, for the Green Deal in itself in the coming years. The report addresses a number of very important issues. I mean, especially now what we see here in the, in the recommendations. Um, having a holistic approach to it, I think, is one, is, is one of the most important aspects um, in my opinion. Um, the importance of the grid, for example, is also something that we don't talk about uh, nearly um, enough as we should. Uh, I guess, um, if I remember it correctly, I have about five minutes to, to tell you about my standpoint, so I won't be able to comment on any on everything uh, that was said. Um, but there are a couple of very important things that I want to underline. And, um, I agree that uh, the volatility in the grid increases with the share of renewables, uh, so we will need um, storage facilities not only for increasing, um, we need to increase storage facilities not only for the grid balance, but also for longer term periods and in general to secure um, the energy supply in general. I mean, we, there are some uh, commission predictions that we all work with in terms of um, what the electricity demand and energy demand will be by the year 2050, um, especially if we go towards uh, climate neutrality, which is very important to me. Um, we cannot, I, I personally cannot stress this enough, uh, that it must be our utmost priority to secure constant electricity supply. That is something that will be very important to get our citizens' support for this project of climate neutrality. Our citizens need 
to be assured that they will not have any problems with a constant electricity supply. Nothing will will uh... I think we are suffering a slightly poor connection to Claudia, uh, who's with us from from Austria. Um, Claudia, I hope we're going to get you back online. Let's see if it's better now. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, wonderful. Um, where was I? Okay, in general, to make this quick, because I think I'm well over time already, um, there are a broad range of different technologies that we can uh, talk about, that we can work on. Uh, they have different characteristics. They can be used for different uh, different aspects in the entire energy storage uh, 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 questions that we talk about. And this is why we also need to focus on, 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 on a technology neutral approach. I think that is very important, but that doesn't mean that we cannot talk about the hurdles that specific technologies face, especially if they're already rather close to market or have been proven to work, um, such as pumped hydro storage does. Um, there is still tremendous potential in exploiting the use of existing technologies, and there will be, and it will be even more important to look about up and coming technologies, about uh, their efficiency, the environmental impacts, and so on. And one of the most important things I think that we have in our report is that we want the Commission also to uh, to adopt the holistic approach and how they analyze different technologies. Um, we want them to have, we want there to be a task force that really brings together the different parts of the Commission that deal with energy storage, because there are many parts of the Commission that deal with energy storage. And we want them to work on, on giving us an overview of the entire life cycle of different technologies uh, in energy storage and how they, um, how energy efficient they are, what the different environmental aspects there are that we have to consider and so on. And I think it's important to look at this from the beginning, uh, from production to use to the end of the life cycle to second use, for example, with batteries. And there, um, there are still many different numerous regulatory barriers that hamper different technologies from flourishing. Uh, we need to talk about all of them Double taxation and double network charging, for example, is something that we talk about in the report. It's still common practice in many member states. I do believe that we need to abolish double taxation. I'm fully aware that grid fees are a different uh, topic for some. They are necessary to, to maintain a well-functioning grid and to guarantee supply to everybody, uh, but storage uh, does as well, which is why I think that we need to redesign the idea of network charges. Um, to make them fit for the energy market of the future. Uh, we will need to be very creative coming up with a new system, but I believe that there are many smart people working in energy policy, so I'm sure we will find a solution. And then let me just, let me just finish up with one sentence then. Uh, there are many, many topics that I have here in my notes that I wanted to talk about, but to make this quick, uh, it's important that we talk about storage holistically. As was mentioned before, there are many different approaches that we need to consider, but it's important that we include storage generally in the topic of the energy transition. We cannot separate it from increasing the share of renewables. We cannot separate it from, from, the, from talking about the energy transition in general. That is uh, my most important point. Uh, so thank you very much. And if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to get back to me on that. Claudia, thank you very much. That was a very good point to end on. Uh, certainly I took some some uh, some really good points from, from your intervention. Uh, big volume challenge ahead of us uh, uh, and, and a clear expectation uh, from citizens that, that we have to keep the lights on. That's the only way that we're gonna get the buy-in for the overall transition. Um, a technology neutral, holistic approach, um, realizing the, the troubles we, we, we have, uh, looking at all the barriers, perhaps having a, a task force in the commission really dig this out and then address the concrete barriers and permitting, um, double uh, taxation and so on and so forth. Really, really good points. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll get back to you in the, in the debate in, in a second.
Uh, right now, I'd like uh, to ask you to switch your camera, perfect. Uh, and then um, I would like to hear just uh, initial reactions from our other participants uh, to what they've heard from, uh, from, from Claudia as well uh, as uh, Viola. So I'd like now to ask uh, Maximilian uh, to turn on your camera and your mic and give us just a very brief uh, one point that really uh, struck you in, in what you've just heard. You'll get the chance to talk more later, but, I, but here I'll just ask you for one critical point that you took away from this. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Christian. Uh, as being as a representative uh, for uh, the grid operation, system operation, I want to highlight, of course, that we are completely convinced that uh, the storage service will bring stability to the grid operation. And as we see ourselves as uh, the market facilitator and the facilitator of uh, the new born, so to say, prosumers uh, with uh, their consumption and generation, of course, uh, <clears throat> to give them a stable grid and uh, to deal with the volatility of the power flow, which is going back and forth uh, together with the storage service. That is what I want to highlight. Thank you very much, uh, Maximilian. You can turn off your camera and, and your mic for now. Uh, I'd like to give the word to Erki Maya from EDF. If you can turn on your camera and your microphone. There we are. Uh, can we hear you? Erki, what, what, what stood you, out? As the, perfect. What stood out as the, as the most important point for you? Yes, there is a lot of takeaways from this report, and I would like to congratulate also uh, Viola and the Secretariat. But if I had to stress one point, is let's not forget about hydro. Uh, hydro has a lot of advantages. It may be less fancy, less innovative to some people's mind, but it is a key, key asset for storage in Europe. It's already 97% of the grid connected capacity, as it has been said. And if we want to multiply, by six, as the Commission has uh, uh, contemplated. We, we need both a powerful technology and hydro pump storage uh, are powerful, but also mature technology. For the industry, it's a key issue to have mature technology to move into this direction. And, never, and, and uh, last but not least, also a technology that can create jobs with an EU-based value chain. It's a key issue if we want to have the support of our customers to have job creation associated to the Green Deal. And for that, I think we, we do not have uh, uh, sufficiently um, uh, the, the appropriate recognition and the conducive regulation today for hydro. Thank you very much, uh, Erki. Very clear point. Uh, critical importance of, of hydro uh, and mature technologies uh, when we talk about flexibility. Really, really good point. Uh, now over to Beatrice. Um, I hope you're with us. Um, the one point that you have uh, taken away from this. Um, thank you, Christian, and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. So uh, first, I would say that there is a clear role for storage to provide the flexibility that our systems are going to need to ensure security of supply. That's something that was mentioned by, by Viola and also by, by Ms. Gammon. Um, and this comes in a context of a higher uh, electrification of our societies and a higher penetration of renewables. Um, according to the climate target plan, the share of renewable production in the EU needs to go up to 65% uh, or more by, by 2030. And so to enable that, um, uh, my takeaway, or what I retain from what we've heard this afternoon, is the importance of a comprehensive approach. Uh, this is something that was mentioned by Ms. Gammon and very much by, by Viola. That's also a message that uh, we have heard after the publication uh, of, the, of the study from the, from the Commission on the contribution of storage to security of supply. But I'd also highlight, I know it's more than one, but I'll be very brief, the importance of level playing field, of an adequate economic uh, signals and remunerating all services provided and of a thorough implementation of the clean energy package. And, and this is something um, which you can count on the Commission. We will monitor it and ensure there is a proper implementation of the clean energy package. Thank you. Thank you. That was a bit more than one, but uh, still very succinct. Um, before we go into uh, the further discussion, I'd like us to have a quick look at another poll question, uh, which should be coming on the screen uh, in a second. Uh, 
uh, because as we're discussing, uh, we really need a comprehensive approach and that really means looking across the value chain. So based on that, where do you think that storage will be most deployed? Uh, please select one of the uh, options below. Is it hybrid renewable and storage project? Uh, is it grid level? Is it commercial industrial customers uh, or is it the residential customers that we need to bank on uh, when it comes to storage? Please click one of the white uh, squares uh, outside your um, preferred option and then we'll see what, uh, what uh, the audience thinks. Uh, also, don't hesitate to uh, send us your questions uh, via the interface as I described before. Uh, you click the question tab in the interface of, of GoToMeeting and, uh, and then uh, you, you can decide uh, on someone you want to address this question to. So let's see if the results are with us in a second. Mm, there we are. Here we have them. So the expectation is that hybrid and renewables uh, the renewable storage projects, 60% uh, of you think that that's the most likely option for storage to deploy, be deployed. But um, we have firm, uh, firm support for the grid level uh, deployment as well, uh, commercial, industrial customers, um, residential customers uh, somewhat less. I must admit that uh, I've not invested in a Tesla Powerwall myself yet. Who knows what the future brings, but, um, but indeed I think when we're talking about these big investments uh, and, and those volumes that we discussed before, uh, indeed it may be more realistic to, to bet on, on other types of, uh, of uh, deployment. Right, I think we can take down this poll and come back to our uh, participants. Let's see, can we bring back our participants online? There we are, very good. Right, um, I'd like to uh, start out with you, uh, Claudia. Um, we are celebrating today the five years anniversary of the, of the Energy Union. Um, we had the State of the Energy Union uh, chaired by the commissioner uh, today. Uh, in light of the um, proposals that we've seen, uh, the, um, the proposals for higher ambition and so on and so forth, um, where do you see let's say, um, the emphasis needed from the Commission. You mentioned a few ideas before, uh, this task force and focusing on barriers. Are there anything else you, you want to stress? We need to hear you. I think you need to unmute. Sorry. Um, in, the, in the last half year, the Commission has also published a, many, many of these strategies that obviously also focus on, on uh, storage uh, technology, at least in some way, when we talk about hydrogen, for example, that will be a storage topic uh, at some point. But I agree with what was said before that um, I think we first uh, also need to focus on the barriers that are still there for existing storage technologies, such as Palm Tiger, for example. Um, I, I can see that it might not be as exciting as talking about hydrogen because um, that appears to be the, the um, how would you say it, uh, the flashier subject uh, currently at the moment. But um, there are proven technologies that are already in use and that have further technological uh, potential still uh, to develop, to to. To, have, to build uh, pound storage facilities in other European countries as there currently are, for example. There are many um, research projects that are very promising, um, in my opinion. And that is something that I hope will be included in, in, in future um, commission uh, communications. But I, I'm also very excited about, uh, about um, the review of the batteries directive. I think that will uh, bring us uh, um, further along in the discussion and I, I'm very excited to, to see what the Commission has come up with there. Very good point, uh, Claudia. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so hydro, pumped hydro uh, to be deployed in other countries. And by the way, I would like to invite all of the, the panel uh, discussants to, to now turn on their cameras uh, so that we can have a, a bit of an interactive discussion. 
Oh, very good. Um, Arki, I'm sure that was, uh, let's say, water on your mill, what you just heard from Claudia, um, with, uh, with, with the key uh, importance of, of, of hydro, uh, pumped hydro. Um, when, you, when you look at the storage uh, issue uh, or, or the broader sort of investment uh, question in, in EDF, where are your uh, priorities falling uh, in terms of, of storage? Is this something that you're going to uh, uh, prioritize more going forward and, and, and what technologies will that be, I, I guess, in addition to the pumped hydro that you mentioned? Yeah, you're, you're right, Christian. Uh, first of all, we have a, a very strong ambition in, in that respect because we want to invest by 2035 8 billion euros in that technologies. Um, we want to aim at 10 gigawatt worldwide uh, in terms of installed capacity and we already have a lot of up and running projects. I will not mention all of them but uh, you may know that we have one of the largest um, uh, facility in, in the UK, West Burton, 49 megawatts as a frequency response system. We have um, added molten salt technology and solar in Morocco, for example, or we have a, a lot of hydro uh, projects and, and asset, as uh, we have been saying. But what I would like to stress, and, and I would like also to, to go in the same direction than uh, um, Mrs. Claudia Gannon, um, we, we also need the appropriate regulation to do this. We, we, we need actually a, a proper business model and this is not yet the case because what do we need first we need a proper remuneration uh, for flexibility services and this is uh, uh, rightly highlighted into the report uh, drafted by uh, your electric um, today hydro accounts for 50 percent of the flexibility capacity we use also nuclear and this is uh, uh, valuable for the whole europe when there is a problem between the northern part of uh, germany and the southern part of germany we use uh, our uh, hydro uh, pump storage or hydro uh, capacity and nuclear to balance the grid but in france this this value to the grid is not properly um, uh, viewed as a, a service and we do not get the appropriate remuneration. And second, we need, and this has been also highlighted by, by many participants today, we need a level playing field between technologies. Um, storage is one solution uh, to answer flexibility, but there is no one-size-fits-all solution and we'll have prosumers, uh, we'll have demand side flexibility, um, we have many, many other technologies and the market will help the most effective uh, and most cost effective uh, solution. Uh, so we have, a, a, again, a strong ambition. We hope we'll get the appropriate uh, regulation, including into the European taxonomy for hydro, which is not yet the case. And uh, also uh, proper long term signals in terms of CO2 pricing, which is key to uh, foster and uh, direct investments into this uh, uh, into the right direction. Beatrice, maybe that's a good uh, segue over to you. We've heard actually uh, today already quite a few ideas for what the Commission could do for storage. Um, we, we heard uh, a, a task force that would basically dig into all the specific barriers uh, and, and look uh, in a, in a cross-cutting manner uh, uh, and, and really a full life cycle perspective at, at storage. And we've heard uh, here from, from Arki some, some, some very clear points about the business case, proper remuneration, long-term signals uh, uh, that would allow for, for, for those major investments to flow. Um, what's, what's your take on this? Um, what is really needed uh, and, and what, what can the Commission come out with in, in the next uh, few years to, to, to tackle this? Um, thank you, Christian. So, um, well, the Commission has taken um, a very good look at, at the report, uh, the resolution of European Parliament, for which Ms. Gammon uh, was the rapporteur, and, and there is already a, a reply, a free copy of the reply that has been sent to, to, to the European Parliament. Uh, the formal one will take a bit longer, this internal cuisine uh, of the Commission. And there, we indeed, we are addressing a number of questions and the points that were raised by Ms. Scammon. Um, and we are really considering what she, what she suggested and the idea of a comprehensive strategy and setting up a, a task force. That's something for the Commission to really consider, because as I said before, this is also 
uh, something um, a message that we've heard from stakeholders uh, following the, the issuing of our of our report and we've been addressing a number of things for example if you look at the energy system integration strategy that was published in July this year we already uh, talk a number of things about the uh, better planning, better integration, about the issues with taxation and the commission ideas about aligning taxation with the environmental policies and avoiding double taxation. So uh, the commission is aware of this and, and is considering um, all these points. And as I said, there is further reflection of, of going because this is a point, uh, a point taken. Uh, but, but there are more things that are being done. For example, um, today uh, the Commission published the individual uh, assessment of the NECPs, uh, the National Energy Climate Act plans, and their um, storage has been identified as one of the reform and, uh, and investment uh, priorities for member states to consider when they are preparing the recovery and resilience plans. And this means that this would be eligible for recovery funds because of its contribution to the, the green transition so that's that's an important element also storage is eligible for funds under uh, the um, structural funds and um, there are other tools where the role of storage and its importance for example in ensuring security of supply will be portrayed for example member states are now working in uh, risk preparedness plans uh, which are due in April next year in 2021 these are draft risk preparedness plans and there, member states will, uh, on the one hand, indeed reflect on um, measures that they would put in place to manage a crisis, but also measures that would be put in place to prevent a crisis. And member states will consider uh, short-term and seasonal um, adequacy. And these plans will be cross-checked by other member states, and, and also the Commission will assess them. And the final plans are due in January 2022, and the Commission will publish its assessment of the plans, and it would be available to, to everyone. Well, that's an interesting point. So also use the, the risk, uh, risk preparedness plans uh, and, and essentially, uh, as I heard, you make uh, storage investments eligible uh, for, for funds from the, from the recovery and resilience facility that's, that's currently being planned and, and, um, and very soon to be, be implemented. Um, Maximilian, over to you. Um, so you represent the, the distribution system operators. Um, how do you see the, the issue of storage investments? Do you think that this will eventually defer uh, investments in grids or do you see a competition or, or is it complementary? What's, what's your take? Uh, thank you, Christian. I definitely see this complementary to what we have to do anyway. And I'd like to explain that on on the timeline yeah, for uh, the long-term solutions, we need some uh, investments in the networks anyway, that's clear. Uh, but um, for the time now, uh, we have the problem and the challenge that we have to go into the high volatility and keep the grid stable during that phase. And for that, any flexibility is of importance for us. And storage is, uh, I would say, most of the important flexibilities among the flexibilities. Um, and uh, we are also thinking and discussing about uh, flexibility markets to run that on DSO level as well as on TSO level uh, in order to remedy the volatility we are facing. So for sure, we have to look for investments on flexibility and services uh, as well as uh, storage services now to, to run our system now, whereas we have to, of course, uh, think on the investments on the long-term run. So that's a different story. And that is why I say this is complementary. Now the storage and later on uh, reinforcement and, and enlargement of, of the grid, I would say. Thank you very much, uh, Maximilian. Uh, Viola, last word in, in this uh, round uh, to you. Um, in light of all the discussions you've heard, um, the points made by all the other participants, what, what's the one recommendation that you would sort of um, bring bring to the forefront uh, from, from the report? Um, yeah, the main ones have already been uh, said, and we're very happy to hear also from the Commission side the, this uh, approach of the uh, from a holistic angle and and, and the the uh, examples mentioned for the preparedness plans and the NSCPs. Um, 
actually it, it's it's definitely this approach which has to be which would really need a, a strong monitoring and an extremely um, comprehensive involvement of the different players this level playing field is absolutely necessary the most important one the um, uh, takeaway of, of, of barriers or reducing of barriers however it is extremely challenging um, always so it will be learning by doing <laughs> in a way also so we need a, a very strong monitoring and, and then being able to, to adapt and adjust where, where also where it's necessary and the storage report will definitely not be the the last uh, uh, your electric work on it <laughs> very good so we are um, we are coming towards the end very quickly. Um, I do want to take one question from uh, from the audience out there uh, that I've received here on my phone. Let's see. Um, uh, this is an interesting one. Um, what do you think is the main solution to long-term energy storage? Uh, for instance, uh, windless winters uh, in northern Europe. That's a very interesting question, uh, one that I also noted when I saw your your um, slide, which basically shows that, that seasonal storage is the one that really expands very dramatically when we go far uh, forward. Maybe I could uh, shoot that question over to you, Erki, as, as really the, the, the big utility representative here, and, and then have a quick uh, view from uh, our two uh, um, uh, policymakers. Thank you, Christian. Well, um... When we look at uh, long-term uh, perspective, as a utility, we, we don't see a need before 2035. But it's true that we have to, to, to get prepared and, and look at these things. I hear a lot about uh, hydrogen for this purpose. Um, viewed from EDF, th this would be a mistake because we think we should, we could use, and we can, and we must use hydrogen to abate emissions uh, for uh, sectors where direct electrification is not possible and uh, for uh, uh, heavy transport, for example, or uh, the industry or, or others. Um, but nevertheless, it is true that uh, we'll need some sort of uh, seasonal storage and hyd hydrogen can play a role. But let's not uh, change the uh, order of uh, priorities. Okay, very clear message here. Uh, hydrogen, yes. But um, but let's use hydrogen where hydrogen is most needed, which is in the hard to abate sectors. Uh, Claudia, you also had this um, hydrogen is flashy, but um, but when you look at this uh, seasonal issue, what 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 is your preferred option, or what what do you see here? Well, I agree that that hydrogen really wouldn't be the answer right now uh, to to uh, to these questions it's too inefficient for that use especially if you want to use green hydrogen it's just not feasible yet um, I think we should uh, we have to talk more about thermal storage I think that's that's um, that has a lot more potential than people would think right now and uh, I mean for a windless winter in northern Europe I guess thermal storage is already in use in, in many nor many northern European countries with great success um, so I think that is one of the topics that we really should talk about more interesting uh, more use of thermal storage very good point Betty uh, over to you the Commission seems to be uh, quite keen on, on hydrogen um, what, what's your take on, on this question well that's that's one of the key elements indeed, and that's one of the key challenges uh, to to address the seasonal uh, storage. That's really one of the keys, and we'll have to see. And there are many elements to take into consideration. We need to consider the technologies, the evolution of the technologies, because also, as Viola said, uh, even in those that are firm, there are still uh, technology elements to to address. There is an issue of economics, uh, but there is clearly uh, a, an issue of of the carbon ice in our society. And, and indeed, uh, hydrogen has a key role to play that. So not only providing the, the flexibility of the system, but also helping to carbonize um, key sectors. So um, this is what I would say. It, it's, it's difficult because indeed seasonal is the key challenge that we had for, ahead uh, uh, of ourselves. And uh, from here to 2030, 2050, there are many things that need to be considered and economics can change. And indeed, that's sometimes one of the difficulties we hear in, in developing a business case for, for storage, the fact that the costs are in some technologies, for example, decreasing 
very, very, very fast. Um, and we need to see also how these plays in, in hydrogen. There are good news and there seems to be estimates about lowering the costs, which would help deploy it at a larger scale or, or faster. But um, it's, it's a key question. It would be very good to have a crystal ball and be able to have all the answers to, to these questions now ahead of uh, 2050. I think that's a very good uh, note to end on. Uh, the, the key question remains how we bring the, the summer into the winter uh, and, uh, and many uh, technology options will be needed for that going forward. Um, it is now uh, 1500 and uh, we need to, to wrap this very interesting discussion up. I want to thank all of you for having participated. I think this was a very uh, rich discussion. I won't make the attempt to, to really sum all this up. Just three key points major need for storage in the future energy system. Uh, we have many of the technologies, some of them need to be developed further, but it's less of a technology challenge than a policy challenge to make uh, the frameworks right for it, to make the investment signals right, and, uh, and to make sure that we remove all the barriers in order to make this uh, massive deployment happen over the next decades. Your Electric will be back with uh, uh, webinars very soon. Um, you can download all the materials from this uh, webinar. We'll send a mail around to all the participants as well. Um, do follow us on uh, at your electric, uh, uh, voice your view on uh, hashtag storage, hashtag it's electric uh, on Twitter, and, um, and join us for future webinars. I think we may have a few ones to show for you right here on the Next slide, exactly. On the 10th of November, we'll be back with a webinar on e-mobility uh, under the series e-vision. And uh, on the 26th, we have our major uh, digital event uh, where we present our AI vision paper. Uh, and we have some, some very, very fascinating uh, uh, participants and, and key keynote speakers. So um, stay tuned for more and thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.